Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for, for joining. Um, I am here this morning to talk about a topic, uh, experience-driven commerce. Now, before I get into what that is and why I'm here, um, I want to talk a little bit about experiences. And I want to take us back a couple of months. Who here in London joined us uh, in Las Vegas a couple of months ago for Imagine? Ra raise of hands. All right, a good number. So for those of you who were with us in Vegas, you'll remember that we changed the game. We changed the experience. We moved from uh, you know, the last few years of Imagine being in a conference ballroom to upping the ante, upping the game, and moving to a theater. So I'm incredibly impressed that the Meet, Meet Magento uh, community and Jamie and the JH team have upped the ante here in London and brought us to this fantastic venue. I think you know, it really helps set the theme of what I want to talk about, which is just creating great experiences. Now, if we can uh, get the slides up, here we go. So when we think about great experiences, um, there's this fantastic quote from Brian Chesky, who's the co-founder and CEO of Airbnb. And Brian famously cited that the, the key to Airbnb success is defining the perfect experience, then figuring out how to deliver it. And I think as we think about sort of the, the world and, and what commerce means um, as we sort of approach the end of this decade and will rapidly move into the next decade and the evolution of commerce, we really need to start thinking about what that really, really perfected ex consumer experience is and how as Magento we're going to deliver it. And I think no better sort of example of this and embodies the change that we're going through is Tesla. Now, one of the things um, that we're sort of, I think, fully bought into and, and with our um, new friends at Adobe, one of the things that they've been saying for years and years is that people buy experiences, not products. And we couldn't agree more. I think if we think about um, sort of Tesla and that, that purchase experience with Tesla, it's all about owning an experience with Tesla more so than it is owning the car itself. And I've personally been through this. Um, you know, I'm a Tesla fanboy. Um, I was first uh, sort of introduced to Tesla a couple of years ago when I sort of opportunistically took a, a, a test drive in a Model S and fell in love with it straight away. Just completely differentiated experience. And I'm a petrol head. You know, I spent years obsessing about, you know, uh, performance cars and, and reading magazines. So it was a really game-changing experience for me but it was completely outside of my price range. You know, I could not afford a Model S. So, you know, the Model 3 came along, and um, one day, having sort of just chatted to a friend who'd uh, just bought a, a, a Nissan Leaf, I was like, you know what? Maybe I should put my $1,000 deposit down on my Model 3. And straight away, I got really hooked on the experience. Um, you know, I was able to do this on my mobile phone. I was able to learn all about the, the, the promise of the Model 3, and I was able to put that in that deposit. But I did so sort of thinking it would be two years or so until I sort of saw my car. And, and weirdly, um, I'm based in Canada and things actually happened quite quickly. And just a couple of weeks ago, unexpectedly out of the blue, I got the email, the, your car is ready to configure. And my gosh, was I excited. But you know, the excitement has just built ever since then. Now I don't have my car yet. Um, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's configured and hopefully I will receive it soon. But already, and I haven't even owned the car, I don't have it in my driveway. The ownership experience with Tesla has surpassed, you know, over, in a significant fashion, the experience that I've had buying every other car that I bought in the past 20 years. The digital experience, the communications I've received from Tesla, the brand story, the product storytelling, and of course, the endless YouTube videos that I've watched has completely mesmerized me, not just in the product that I'll be owning, but that end-to-end -end ownership experience. And this is even before I've got to the fun part of you know, drag racing off the traffic lights and trying that not to 60 time. So you know, I think we're in this sort of massive evolution of change where consumers as well as businesses really expect the next generation of commerce to be completely embedded into the overall customer experience, moving beyond what we sort of think about as the, the, the shopping basket, the shopping cart, to include you know, mobile, social, web, in product, the fact that the Tesla is continuously connected. It's an IoT device. It updates itself. It fixes its own brakes. Um, you know, I can unlock it remotely. I can turn the air conditioning on remotely. It's just a game-changing experience. And this, I think, for me, embodies what experience-driven commerce is all about. It's challenging brands and retailers to make every experience consistent, personalized, real-time, and engaging. Now, if we think about experiences, the experience is the brand. 
Brand today, like Tesla, are built on end-to-end -end experiences. It's not just good enough to have a great selling or e-commerce experience. It's about from the very first engagement that may happen in a different channel, whether that's a physical retail store, um, it can be uh, you know, an online, you know, uh, you know, through social, it can be through any channel. But you know, when you take sort of beautifully curated content and you kind of merge that, combine it with Amazon efficiency, this becomes the holy grail of what a great brand experience is. And it extends, you know, way beyond just the purchase into what we might call the post-purchase experience. It's the delivery, it's the unboxing, it's how that delivery occurs, it's how efficient we are with that delivery. So the world of e-commerce is changing. It's also becoming more and more complex. Um, you know, if we go back in time, the, the path to the customer used to be pretty straightforward process. Um, there was one web channel, there was an e-commerce store, you bought through that channel. In today's digital world, things have gotten really, really more complex. Um, you know, that linear process is, is going away, and it's a really interesting dynamic for people who are thinking about experiences. The challenge is to create a really seamless, delightful experience throughout the customer journey. Now, if we think about what a customer journey today looks like, we might map it to this. And you know, our friends at Adobe have, I think, have done an excellent job of defining the way that they think about the five phases of customer experience. And from the Magento world, you know, I think you know we, we've always lived in the sort of the consideration and and, con and and conversion phases. You know, it's all been around sort of the buying experience. When consumers come to the e-commerce website, how do they sort of you know find products, uh, navigate around, you know, get to that product detail page, check out and buy. But it's actually this broader journey, um, and and you know it really starts sort of in the awareness phase when we create um, awareness primarily through advertising around the the brand, and we create that brand or product or or retailer awareness. There's then that discovery phase of how to actually get the consumer to our website, the demand gen. How do we get them there? What are all the channels that we're using? Social reviews, blogs, uh, direct email, uh, engaging through na uh, na native apps, et cetera, that actually drive the consumer to our Magento site. When we're on the Magento site, you know, I think we, we understand well um, you know, all of the things that Magento does really, really well to help convert that consumer and make them buy. But there's also, you know, when we think about sort of the commerce experience, we used to think that commerce was sort of the end of the journey. When they click the buy button, that was it, job done, thank you, the order's in the database. Uh, someone else will worry about fulfilling it, that's not my worry. And that's really changed as well. I think you know, this post-purchase experience, the support phase of the customer uh, journey has really become now um, a very critical phase, um, I think in part because if we want to compete with Amazon, this is the phase that we really have to nail. This is the phase that we have to perfect. We have to make sure <laughs> that we can create uh, a, a, a delivery experience um, and an ownership experience that parallels what uh, an Amazon Prime member is used to, is used to, uh, to experiencing. So what I want to spend sort of the next 20 minutes or so talking about is you know, this change in consumer expectations and change in buyer expectations. Um, and there's a perpe perpetual shift uh, underway. And I want to look at sort of four key trends that are happening in e-commerce that are really going to change the way that we think about, um, you know, the, the, the way that we deliver Magento sites, the way we think about sort of the context of what is commerce. Because I've been in this space for 15 plus years, and I would argue that the pace of change today is faster than it's ever been before. And what commerce looks like in the next decade will be very, very different to what commerce has looked like for the last 15 years. So the first of these is mobile. Um, and I would argue that we are rapidly entering a phase of mobile only rather than mobile first. Um, Asia is already mobile only. Um, here in the UK, in North America, we are increasingly heading towards this. There are certain brands that we interact with that are mobile-only brands, but the desktop website is still around, um, still gets about 45% of all traffic usage. So we're, we're, we're on this journey um, towards mobile-only, and it's happening fast. Um, Google is about to change the ranking algorithms um, and start evaluating you know, mobile speed as one of the um, uh, criteria that goes into their ranking algorithms. And all of this is sort of driving more and more adoption by consumers in mobile. 
We need to create absolutely perfected experiences. And this is really about content. Um, when a consumer comes to a Magento website, they want perfect information. They want to really understand everything possible about the product, the price, the promotions, the competitive intel, and making sure that all of that information is readily available at their fingertips. We need to remove all purchase anxiety. We can't have this world where the customer's on our PDP page and there's some niggling sort of anxiety around some piece of knowledge that they're missing that says, I've got to go somewhere else to get that knowledge to know if this is the right product to buy. And we have to do all of this fast and frictionless. Um, we, we need you know, smooth and seamless experiences. There's no patience for friction or delays. And I think this sort of embodies what's wrong with mobile today. You know, mobile is unfortunately still slow. Um, it's very, very common you know, when I'm on a, a mobile site that you know, the page load times are six to eight seconds. That's horrendous. That doesn't encourage us to embrace e-commerce. It doesn't encourage us to, uh, uh, to buy online. And then finally, as I sort of mentioned already, we need great post-purchase experiences. The expectations for what happened after we click the buy button have been severely heightened because the norm is Amazon Prime. Amazon Prime is the benchmark. Every other retailer has to be able to provide that phenomenal delivery experience. You may not be Burger King, but they want it their way. So let's take a look at each of these in more detail. So mobile only, there really should be nothing that we can't buy anymore on our phone. I can buy a Tesla on my phone. In the B2B world, our B2B clients are buying expensive, multi-thousand dollar industrial equipment on their mobile phones. The desktop commerce is still in existence today, I would argue, because, um, because the mobile buying experience it isn't where it needs to be. We, we still sort of are designing in the safety net today because mobile experiences are still clunky. You know, responsive uh, web design is slow. It's frustrating. We haven't yet optimized experiences for, for touch. And I think this is part of the problem of what responsive has done. It's, it's, it's certainly made it a lot better than it was six, seven years ago, but we've still got a long, long way to go. And uh, you know, I think you know, the, the phones, the devices, the screens are there to support mobile, um, but we haven't yet sort of nailed the experience. And, and this is pretty clear, sort of, I think, for most retailers when you look at their conversion stats. This is pretty typical. Um, this is some data from Forrester Research. So, you know, 49% of all traffic coming from mobile, 46% coming from desktop, but yet mobile only seeing a 1.7% conversion rate versus the 3.5% that we're used to on desktop. And this is a major, major problem for all of our customers, all of our retailers, because for some of them, as their mobile traffic is rapidly shifting, or traffic is rapidly shifting to mobile, they're seeing that um, uh, there's actually a, uh, uh, a decrease in their, uh, in, in, in their revenues because the conversion rates aren't where they need to be. So at Magento, we talked a lot about progressive web apps. You're going to hear more about this from us today. I think we have three separate presentations uh, on progressive web apps. And we're really, really bullish that we believe progressive web apps are the future of the web. They bring all of the greatness of what we love about a native mobile app, fast, slick, designed first for a touch-based experience, being able to do push notifications, uh, having offline mode, um, and bringing all of that greatness of a mobile app into the mobile web browser. Um, when doing so in, in such a way um, that we actually, perhaps for most of us, won't need to invest in native apps anymore, removing that pain of having to develop for, uh, for Android and iOS and those very large development budgets that we need to build native apps. Native apps will start to I think they'll always be relevant for major brands um, with a high uh, degree of interaction with, with the consumer, like you know, your Facebooks and your Instagrams of the world. But a lot of brands now are investing in progressive web apps. And if we take a look at some of those brands, I think PWAs are rapidly moving from sort of the early adopter phase that they've been in for the last year, 18 months, to the mainstream. And, and major technology brands, media companies, online retailers are all revisiting their mobile web versus mobile app strategy. They're building PWA-based experiences to replace their responsive experiences. And the results are impressive. Um, you know, Forbes saw 50% faster page loads. Um, Twitter now seeing page load times on their website below three seconds with their PWA. Uh, West Elm saw a 9% increase in, in revenue per visit. Uh, Lancome saw a 17% increase in conversions. So this is really having 
having a positive impact. Um, and we're very, very excited about Magento's investment in PWAs. And like I said, you'll hear more about that um, you know, throughout the day. But I think this is going to be one of the big transitional shifts that we're going to see in 2019. If this isn't priority number one for all retailers in 2019, um, I'll be very, very surprised. Okay, moving on, um, I want to talk next about um, experience perfection. So perfecting the digital selling experience um, really allows brands, manufacturers, and retailers to push the boundaries of what we as consumers are comfortable buying online um, across the board in, in every industry and in every vertical. And, you know, I, I think... Um, you know, one of the things, that we, there was always been a challenge that there's certain things you, you couldn't buy online um, that sort of mandated a face-to-face -face, uh, uh, interaction with a salesperson or that you physically had to go to a store to sort of tangibly touch or try a product. Um, and because the, the evolution of digital is really changing all of this, where we're now transitioning to a world where we're pretty much comfortable to buy absolutely anything online, um, where the purchase can happen entirely in a digital uh, environment. And I think there's no better example of this than the mattress industry. Um, you know, one of our clients at Magento um, is uh, um, Tomorrow's Sleep, as well as other brands like Casper, who have completely rewritten the playbook for selling mattresses. Um, you know, mattresses were always considered sort of the last hurdle for e-commerce. They were expensive, uh, heavy, expensive to deliver, um, high rates of returns. You know, you had to go to the showroom to lie on the mattress to see which one was going to be the right one for you. And these digital brands now are completely changing this. They've done this by obsessing about great content online, storytelling, really making the consumer feel comfortable buying such a product as a mattress uh, online, um, you know, with one place where they can get all of the information about the product, how to pick the mattress, um, and order it right there. And I think for a lot of consumers, this is really, really key because it removes that sort of used car, car sort of sales experience of having to go into the mattress store, that sort of uncomfortable sales pressure environment in the showroom. And if you can digitize all of that um, and, and make it comfortable for someone to buy something like a mattress online, then we're really sort of really winning and, and removing those last hurdles around e-commerce. You know, another great example of this is shoppable content. Um, you know, companies like Crate and Barrel have done, you know, for a long time, sort of take it in that digital glossy magazine and put the little hover, hover overs are. So as you're kind of exploring all of the products they, they, they offer, you can um, get more into, um, you know, what, what you can actually buy and hover over and click the buy button. But I think a great example of this I came across recently, if anyone's built a house or you're in sort of the construction trade, you'll, you'll know about House. Um, house is sort of the, the leading global um, online community for sort of home renovation builders and designers. And you know, their business model right from the outset, which is sort of driving their $4 billion valuation, in part has been shoppable content. The fact that you know, the, the companies who sell uh, you know, taps and sinks and so forth can sell their products through House. Now, you know, today there are 20,000 different sellers offering over 10 million products on House. And, you know, things were sort of working okay. But one of the things that, that House did recently was introduced a new um, product called uh, View in My Room. It's a 3D tool uh, through your smartphone, allows you using augmented reality to overlay the products that they sell on House into your own home and actually see what that product would look like in your living room, in your kitchen. And after they did this, they saw that users were 11 times more likely to make a purchase on the website if they had used that 3D visualization tool. And I think that's a really compelling story about how shoppable content is really coming into the mainstream now. Another thing um, I think really taking off is um, subscription business models. If you're like me, you're 40 years old, you've got two kids and you're starting to uh, rapidly go a little bit gray, um, then you know, uh, companies like Just For Men have, I think, really sort of, you know, again, a great Magento customer, really sort of nailed the subscription model now where um, you know, a, a, a male who, who needs to uh, keep, keep the hair uh, color in place can subscribe so that they don't need to worry about ever running out of hair dye. Um, it comes via subscription. And we see this across the board. You know, another client of ours, our Birchbox, doing this with sort of the, um, you know, the creative gift boxes, and even Gap getting into the subscription model. Um, if you're um, if you're a parent with, with, with a newborn, you so you can subscribe to get clothes, and Gap will send you the three month old, the six month old, the nine month old, the one year old. They know when to send you the next batch of clothes for your baby. And this is really, um, I think, again, disrupting e-commerce. It's removing the need as for consumers for us to think 
think about replenishment, um, to think about sort of, um, you know, purchases. They're taking a lot of the, the, the heavy thinking away from us. Just let, put the trust in a brand and let the brand do the hard work for us. And then another example, sort of final example of this is IoT. Another one of Magento's customers, Nestle, with this great, um, uh, you know, it's effectively the, the curate coffee maker for, for baby milk. Um, and I think what's great about this is just uh, it, it's, a, it's a connected, personalized service that um, allows you to um, understand the nutritional needs for your baby, get alerts through your smartphone app. But the e-commerce portion of it, the replenishment of the milk capsules, is all managed by Magento on a subscription model. So you never need to worry about running out of uh, a baby milk capsules. The machine knows um, when you need to reorder and will reorder on your behalf. And we see more of this. It's uh, you know, more and more products being connected in uh, to, you know, via I IoT into the commerce environment. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is sort of fast and frictionless. Um, you know, I think as we sort of rapidly approach the next decade, the way that we shop online is going to change. And, and the writing's already on the wall. Um, we won't necessarily always have a screen involved in an e-commerce purchase. We won't always shop through a phone, shop through a laptop or a desktop. Um, voice and neural commands are going to become increasingly uh, sort of influential in how we shop. We've already seen this with Alexa. Uh, we've got innovations coming out of MIT where you can wear a little uh, headband that will actually read your thoughts. So you'll be able to think a purchase. Um, this may seem far-fetched, but I would argue it's probably going to happen quicker than any of us are ready for it to happen. And then you in, sort of merge all of that with AI learning algorithms and you know, the brands and companies that we buy from will be able to learn about our shopping habits and our shopping patterns and actually predict what we need, um, especially as it comes to household goods, groceries and fast food meal services. They're gonna know what we want before we know what we want. So let's look at some sort of examples about how we're removing um, friction from e-commerce process. You know, the checkouts obituary has already been written in a way. Um, you know, things like Apple Pay, um, you know, uh, Android, Google Pay, whatever they call it today, um, you know, really removing the need to even go through a checkout process today. And it's incredibly intuitive. You know, if you've used Apple Pay either on the desktop or um, uh, on the phone, you know, you just say you want to pay with Apple Pay, one look at your face ID and boom, it's done. Um, and you've removed, you know, four steps from the checkout process. And, it, and it's really, you know, changing the game. Um, we see this across across the board, you know, there's the new web payments APIs coming out from all the browsers, uh, Google and Safari and so forth, removing sort of the concept of form field from the, uh, from the, check, from the checkout, from the address, from the, um, the billing address, the shipping details, the credit cards, where instead all of your information is saved in the browser, all of your preferences, your billing addresses and so forth. So again, you just get to that one touch checkout uh, on your device. You know, conversational commerce is really becoming real. I think, you know, the UK, um, you know, we're seeing this already. Um, Alexa rapidly changing the way we buy consumable goods from Amazon. We can pretty much buy anything by talking to Alexa. But Alexa is an open platform, and we're seeing, uh, you know, companies and, you know, uh, grocery chains in the UK like Morrison's and Ocado, uh, you know, integrating with Alexa. Um, and this is just the start. Uh, I think when you combine this with AI and ML, um, the, the super, your supermarket will know exactly what you need. They'll know how many people are in your family. They'll know how, uh, exactly what meals your family eats for breakfast, for lunch, for dinner. They'll know what your favorite meals are. They'll be able to track your consumption. They'll know that the, where the milk they sold you last week expires on Tuesday and needs to be replenished. And so you bring all of this together, and especially, I think, in groceries, that we're going to get to a world where our grocery shopping is highly automated. It's run uh, for us using uh, machine learning and AI algorithms, um, and where we need to interact and perhaps change things, we'll do so primarily through voice. And then all of this sort of applies in the physical world as well. Um, so, you know, kind of automating where we almost get to sort of an unconscious list, uh, unconsciousness uh, checkout where, you know, we can think about a purchase, we can say a command for a purchase. Well, in the physical retail store, we can just walk out of the store. And, and, and again, Amazon really disrupting and innovating here with their Amazon Go stores in the US, um, all of the cameras on the shelves that know exactly what you've picked up and put in your basket, and then you just walk out uh, and, and they automatically sort of bill you to your, to your primary account. Account. So this is going to change the face of retail. Um, it's already happened here in the UK, you know, with mass aut automation of the automated checkouts, but you still have to manually scan, and all of that's going to go away. You're just going to walk into the store and walk out of the store. Um, so again, a lot of change coming. 
Now, if we think about sort of um, the sort of the last phase on this journey, um, the, the post-purchase experience, I've talked a lot about this already, but it's going to become increasingly important for brands and retailers to shift their focus on what it means to deliver an exceptional experience in the immediate aftermath of an online order. Um, and if we think about this today, you know, all retailers are scrambling to try and not beat Prime, because that's really hard, but to meet the value prop of, of, of Prime. And if you look at this data from Forrester, um, this is a survey they recently did asking retailers about their fulfillment priorities for 2018. And you can see right up there, the number one priority, 42% of retailers saying that they need to uh, improve the speed at which they ship products to consumers so that they can better uh, meet Prime. And Prime is a formidable force. And if you look at the, the options available here in the UK, unlimited one-day shipping, same-day delivery, Prime Now, um, and Amazon pickup locations, they've made it incredibly convenient uh, to, um, uh, to buy and to use the Prime service. Now, how have they done this? Um, they've done this by disrupting, um, and they've created a secret weapon. Um, what they've really done, what Amazon have done, is sort of tapped into the gig economy to build their own low-cost, scalable delivery network. Um, they, they effectively allow uh, people like you and me to sign up for a second job um, to, uh, to become Amazon delivery drivers. They call this Amazon Flex. Um, there's no employment contract. I can work when I want, um, how I want. Uh, all I need is a car. I go to the, uh, the fulfillment uh, uh, warehouse, I, uh, I'm given some boxes to put on the back seat, and I go out and I drive and deliver them. Um, and uh, you know, it's, a, it's an on-demand model, so rates change depending on, on how busy and a time of day it is. And Amazon also recruiting sort of small local carriers, not just working with the established carriers, but actually encouraging new companies, new startups in each of the towns and cities that they operate to actually um, to become delivery uh, operators, to become delivery providers for Amazon. So they're rewriting the, the, the playbook. They're saying, listen, we don't just have to work with the Royal Mail and with the established carriers. We're actually going to create our own delivery network. Um, and this, I think, is, is, is highly disruptive. Um, and then, you know, one of the other really disruptive things that Amazon are doing um, is this, uh, this Amazon key concept. And I would argue that this is perhaps um, one of the biggest opportunities to disrupt the e-commerce post-purchase experience uh, in the next five years. And what Amazon Key is, it's effectively utilizing sort of the trend around uh, yeah, IoT devices, especially IoT front door locks, and linking that to your Amazon Prime account. So now that big sort of hurdle, that big delivery anxiety of what if I'm not at home? What is the driver going to leave my expensive purchase on the doorstep? Am I going to get that horrible delivery, failed delivery notice on my door and have to go reschedule the delivery or go to the warehouse and pick it up after work. No, all of that goes away. Now I don't need to worry if I'm not at home because I can delegate and authorize the, um, the Amazon delivery uh, driver to open my front door, leave my purchase inside of my door and securely close my door again. So it doesn't matter if anyone's at home. Now, you might argue that this is sort of, well, are we socially ready for this? Are we prepared to let a stranger in our house? Well, if I'd stood here 10 years ago and told you that we wouldn't take taxis anymore, we'd all take rides in a stranger's car, you probably wouldn't have believed me. If I'd stood here 10 years ago and said that you know, we wouldn't stay in hotels anymore and we'd all stay in an Airbnb at a stranger's house, you probably wouldn't have believed me. So I think, you know, especially with millennials, this type of disruption is real. It's happening. Um, you know, Amazon even pushing the boundaries further in the US They've done a partnership with General Motors um, where they can actually deliver to your car. You can leave your car parked in the car park while you're at work, and the Amazon delivery driver can remotely unlock your boot, put in your, put in your purchase, close your boot again, and all you need to worry about at the end of the day when you're done work is driving your car home. Your Amazon delivery is already there. So this is the type of disruption that's happening, and it's very, very real. And we think sort of, sort of in this last phase, you know, winning beyond the buy button, um, you know, there, there's really sort of kind of three phases of things we need to think about. Um, there's sort of that anticipation and immediate post-purchase excitement. How do we do things right after the buy button to make the consumer incredibly excited about that purchase, having them watch videos about their product, how it's made, re register right away as an owner, join the loyalty club? How do we retain that consumer um, over the long term? How do we 
really make that sort of first few moments, those first few days when they're first using their product really engaging through you know, help and product registration, engaging with the broader ownership community, other owners, other people who, who have bought that same product. And in long term, how do we have them become um, fans, advocates? How do, they, how do we make them sort of really tell the story about not just how great the product was, but how great the ownership experience of owning that product was, that brand interaction? So I've covered here sort of you know, four things. What I want to sort of just wrap up with now is talking a little bit about the um, Adobe and Magento uh, um, uh, tie-up. And you know, obviously, imminently, Magento is formally set to join the Adobe family. Um, not quite sure when that's happening, but it's certainly uh, highly likely to happen before the end of the month. Um, and we couldn't be more excited about the joint opportunity in front of us. Um, you know, Adobe's kind of uh, tagline has been changing the world through digital experiences. And you know, we believe that Magento plus Adobe really has this great opportunity to change the world rather than the world changing around us. Um, we're better positioned now being part of the Adobe family now than we've ever been in the past to be pioneers in changing the world of commerce rather than just reacting to the change. I think we're really setting ourselves up for you know, some of the changes that I just talked about that are gonna happen uh, into the next decade of commerce. And sort of how is this gonna happen? You know, I, I showed that workflow earlier of sort of the customer journey. And you know, Adobe, I think, have done a very good job of defining these phases in the customer journey. And there's no doubt that you know, what Magento brings to the table um, fills a, a big gap in, in Adobe's portfolio um, of being able to support the commerce transaction, of being able to support that, con that conversion uh, uh, part of the, uh, of the customer journey. But Magento is a lot more than just you know, being able to fill a, a checkout and be able to complete a purchase. You know, Magento is um, sort of highly, um, uh, or, or brings up a sort of holistic um, set of capabilities, certainly in sort of the discovery, consideration, um, conversion, and support phases of that journey. And then if we look at what Adobe brings to the table, Adobe has some great best-in-class products um, from their experience cloud that are heavily used by marketers to drive awareness, you know, so search, display, video advertising. They've got great products through their content management, uh, AEM tools um, to drive sort of uh, omni-channel experiences, great product uh, content experiences, personalization experiences. They've got great tools in the form of things like Adobe Target to really help us optimize that sort of consideration experience, how we search and merchandise, visual configuration, do A-B testing, really optimize that experience that the consumer has on the site. And then obviously Magento brings best-in-class tools to the table around um, you know, conversion optimization, shipping and transacting, uh, omni-channel order management, store fulfillment capabilities, payments and, and, and fulfillment. And then again, you know, Adobe experts around sort of that post-purchase experience, the support experience, things like remarketing, how do we continue to engage the consumer? So I, I think you know, we're we're really, really excited. I mean, Adobe brings sort of the best of expertise in telling great brand stories. Um, they obsess about personalization and, and building data-driven experiences that are optimized with insights from real-time shopping behaviors and multi-channel data. And, and so Magento can further influence, um, you know, or, or further our influence across the shopper's complete life cycle to ensure that every moment is personal, every experience is shoppable, and e-commerce becomes the preferred channel for all purchases. So with that, I just want to wrap up with kind of one closing quote. Um, and I'd like to leave you this one from Alan Kay, the American computer scientist, who said that the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And I think you know, we're really, really excited that with Adobe by our side, this is precisely what Magento is poised to do as we approach the next decade in commerce. So with that, thank you for, uh, for joining me. Um, I do, I do want to just say also a special thanks to Jamie and the JH team for um, organizing such a you know, fantastic event here in the UK. Um, last year when we were here as Magento for uh, Meet Magento Live UK, we obviously made the announcement that we'd be merging the uh, France and UK events into our uh, Barcelona event, Meet Magento uh, Europe. And I think it's a, a great testimony, a testimonial to the power, enthusiasm, and commitment of the Magento community that the Meet Magento Association has picked up the Baton here in the UK and, and put this event um, together in addition to all of the other uh, events that are happening uh, across Europe this year. So we're really, really excited that uh, everyone was able to join us today. And with that, thank you very much.